Hey guys, support for this week's episode comes from our friends at Manscaped, the number one site for men's below the belt grooming. Yes, you heard right. Manscaped offers precision engineered tools for your family jewels. Yes, it rhymes. Yes, it's a hook, but boy, oh boy, this stuff works. It's great. Manscaped, get 20% off and free shipping when you use the code GOODSEATS at manscaped.com. That's 20% off, yes, with free shipping, yes, at manscaped.com. Use that code GOODSEATS. And now, here's our show. We are tied at one. Now, this is the final pairing in the regular set of five. They have to go to five. Rudy Glenn. Here's Glenn with the shot and the deflection. It's in the net. Well, we can go back to we can go back to tension and excitement time now because now the pressure is really on Bob Yarushi, who is the last kicker in this series of five kicks for the Cosmos. If he misses, it will be Chicago who will be the champions. If he scores, then we've got to go into a series of two kicks, one-on-one -on -one kicks as pairs. Bob Yarushi, he is from Toronto. Here comes the kick. If he makes it, they're still tied. If he misses, it's over. Chicago has won. The Chicago Sting has won their first professional sports championship since 1963. This group of men under the leadership of Willie Roy takes it to a shootout. Rudy Glenn scores. Bob Yarushi misses. And the Sting are the 1981 Soccer Bowl champions. Welcome to Good Seats Still Available, a curious little podcast devoted to exploring what used to be in professional sports. Here's your host, Tim Hanlon. All right, time to break out the champagne and reminisce about Soccer Bowl 1981 and the great Chicago Sting. Yes, that's our topic this week. Hi, my name is Tim Hanlon. And this is Good Seats Still Available, our curious little podcast journey each and every week, if you can believe it, into what used to be in professional sports. That clip came uh, to you from the archives of ABC Sports. And yes, that was indeed Vern Lundquist with the uh, color commentator and our former podcast guest, uh, Paul Gardner, calling the action as the Chicago Sting uh, defeated the mighty New York Cosmos in Soccer Bowl 81 from Exhibition Stadium in Toronto. That was on uh, September 26th, 1981. Some of you uh, fans out there may remember that that game was uh, actually not broadcast live. It was actually on tape delay with uh, most of the country. It was played on the following Sunday, if you can believe it, after uh, two years of live and uh, fairly extensive coverage of the NASL by ABC. By 18 1981, excuse me, he says, ABC had uh, pretty much had enough of the NASL, uh, low ratings, and uh, for whatever reasons, were not, not really drawing, uh, arguably scheduling and the irregularity of it or games on Sunday afternoons uh, when really kind of during the summer, nobody's really watching television, et cetera. But uh, in 1981, ABC exercised uh, its claws, I guess, to not only not show any regular season or playoff games, uh, but literally the uh, only the soccer ball and that. Uh, on a tape delay basis. In Chicago, however, uh, a great debate and uh, attempt to get the game to be played uh, live on uh, the uh, WLS Channel 7 Chicago uh, owned and operated station for ABC, but uh, the, the network would not have any of it. So it was uh, it was still tape delay, but it was played later in the evening after the ABC primetime schedule of things like the Love Boat and uh, Fantasy Island. So much to the consternation of most uh, Sting fans, although many of them may, may have listened to it on the radio in real time and live, that was the call of the game for those who stayed up late and enjoyed, if you lived and grew up in Chicago, the first championship of any professional sports team in, in I don't know, a couple of decades. Uh, it was a city, Chicago, that was thirsty for a professional franchise, and the Chicago Sting brought it to them. And that's the topic, finally, uh, after many requests that we get into on this week's episode with our special guest, Mike Conklin, who was the longtime beat reporter for the Chicago Tribune. Yes, that's the uh, one of the two major newspapers in Chicago still, the other being the Chicago Sun-Times. And uh, we get into a uh, uh, just a treasure trove uh, of memories and reminiscences and stories and anecdotes about Mike's time covering the seminal, frankly, team 
in Chicago sports history, but also in the North American Soccer League. It uh, made its debut in the uh, early part of 1975. I think it was actually announced as a franchise on Halloween of all days, 1974. And that's when uh, Cub reporter Mike Conklin kind of, uh, well, we'll get into it. Did he got volunteer for this beat? Uh, did he get volunteered for it? Uh, how big of a beat was it in this sort of still fledgling soccer thing and NASL thing? Uh, we'll get into that. And we're uh, going to kind of go through kind of the Sting's major years until 1982 or so. Yes, there's absolutely uh, indoor success and a little bit further outdoor success that came after that. But Mike kind of gave up the beat uh, in after the 1982 season. That's where kind of our focus is the sort of origins of the Chicago Sting and the North American Soccer League all the way through that championship season of 1981 and the a uh, little bit of the denouement uh, in 82 with our guest this week with Mike Conklin, the uh, former Chicago Tribune beat reporter. And boy, if you go into the archives, you will see. I mean, Mike uh, wrote uh, it almost seemed like a story a day at least. And then some on this team and what coverage the Chicago Tribune and he provided uh, to this team that wound up becoming, uh, uh, again, quite uh, successful and certainly bedrock franchise in the NASL's history. We look forward to getting into that conversation in just a couple of moments. I know I say you're going to always enjoy this, but this one truly uh, you're going to find uh, enthralling uh, as I did. Before we uh, get to our conversation with Mike, I want to say uh, thank you to our sponsors this week at Streaker Sports. And uh, streakersports.com is the place to go for all kinds of great uh, sports memorabilia and outerwear and uh, T-shirts and and all that kind of stuff. And, of course, if you, you've heard me talk about this before, but the place that you want to go on streakersports.com, uh, go to the defunct leagues section. And, yes, there is an extensive, almost comprehensive collection of tremendously crafted and uh, uh, well-done T-shirts celebrating the North American Soccer League, of course, including a, a very smart-looking Chicago Sting gray T-shirt with the original mad-looking B uh, logo from, uh, if you remember, the, the, the movie The Sting that inspired that logo, as well as uh, a few dozen other teams from the old North American Soccer League. This is the Cosmos and the Toronto Metros and the LA Aztecs, the Philadelphia Adams uh, the Jacksonville and the New England team in in both varieties, the Caribou of Colorado, and even, frankly, the Soccer Bowl 81 T-shirt with the actual logo of that game. All of those and many, many more in the special collections area focused on the NASL at StreakerSports.com. And, of course, we've got a promo code for you, and that's Good Seats. Good Seats, that's the promo code for 10% off all of your purchases, including that very smart-looking Soccer Bowl 81 shirt, uh, the New York Cosmos shirt, the Chicago Sting shirt, you name them. They're all there at uh, streakersports.com. Again, that promo code Good Seats for 10% off all of your purchases. Go there early, go there often. As they say, you'll be glad you did, and we thank you to our friends at Streaker Sports for their continued uh, patronage uh, and support of this show. All right, so let's uh, segue nice and smoothly, see, into our tremendous, wonderful, scintillating conversation uh, with our new pal, Mike Conklin, ex of the Chicago Tribune, and we get into covering the beat that was, and uh, frankly, in, in, in people's memory, still is, the great NASL's Chicago Sting. This has been, uh, I've been doing this for about uh, two and a half years. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it's been, I think it was more of a personal exploration of my own interest in uh, teams and leagues that have come and gone. But 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 the idea is sort of like why and how, I guess. So, and and frankly, I could trace it directly to my uh, my love of the New York Cosmos back in the day, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, when I was sure. a kid growing Warner, up. Warner Communications. And sure. And and growing up and seeing the NASL teams coming and going and all that kind of stuff. And Giorgio Canale. Yeah. What all this, <laughs> what happened, all that stuff. And then, and then just that begets all the sort of other yeah, sort of yeah. teams and leagues. Have come. But so when I saw you at the, 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 uh, at the bookstore, book yeah. and I know you had written a book sort of almost in the, in the hagiography, I guess, of your experience. Otto is in that. Arno is in that. Paul Hahn is in that. I mean, you know, <laughs> yeah, I mean, they are. I mean, they were the inspiration for, for much of what I did because they were such colorful, distinctive characters, I think, you know. Well, so why don't we start then? So sure. maybe before we get into the Sting situation sure. and, the, and all sure. of that, how did you even become sort of a sports writer in the first place? How did you, when did you divine that this was going to be your career path 
let alone getting into sports and the Chicago Tribune and all that stuff? Um, I, I got started. I, I was writing. I was a sports writer when I was in high school for a local town newspaper. And I did it because um, I got cut from the basketball team and I still wanted to make the trips. And so my dad, who commiserated with me on the whole thing, he knew the publisher of the small paper. And they said, well, how would you like to go to the games and cover them for the newspaper? And I did it and I loved it. You know, I, I love the idea of being the voice or being the eyes and ears for people that couldn't be there. And so, um, you know, I, I, uh, I kept doing that in high school. I did it in college. I quit school for two years. I, I tell people I invented the gap year concept and I went away from, uh, college for a couple of years, but I got a job on a small daily newspaper in Iowa. And then I switched and I ended up working in Belvedere, Illinois, uh, for two years as the sports writer and the city editor. At the same time, I covered police and fire, but I, and I covered sports mainly it was high school sports, but occasionally I'd make a trip into Chicago and do some feature that maybe there would be like a local angle. Somebody that was from the Rockford Belvedere area was playing on one of the teams and I'd arrange an interview and um, I started to learn that you could have access with this stuff. And then I started to, I went back to college, finished, came right back, right back to the Tribune and they put me in sports uh, where I was for about 20 of my 36 years. <laughs> well, so, so why sports? Like was sports sort of your first love, your first interest? You just happen to fall into sports mm -hmm. and because you're mentoning access, which I think is mm -hmm. really almost sort of the. Lost. Maybe the well, the well, the unwritten sort of thing right. about being a journalist, right? Where you right. you get that kind of access, maybe right. a little, perhaps uh, beyond uh, uh, sure. necessity. Sure, sure, yeah. And you 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 get to you get to peek behind the curtain is what it is. And I'm a nosy guy, and I've always been that way. And I've always been curious about stuff. And I'm also very cynical about a lot of stuff too. And a lot of my cynicism was actually confirmed <laughs> by what I saw with some of the athletes, some of the coaches, some of the cliches, you know, the trite stories, all that kind of stuff. And um, when, when I when I came to Chicago, I mean, this is a great place to be if you if you have those kinds of traits in you. And, and uh, you know, I would go to games and sit up in the press boxes sometimes, even when I wasn't covering those particular events. And, uh, uh, and to me, I, I, what I really liked too was I, I started out writing high school sports and I wrote a lot about, I covered the very first uh, uh, Illinois high school football championships, the first two class basketball system. It was only two classes in those days. And I wrote a lot about stuff like 16 inch softball. I wrote feature stories about that stuff. I like to write about stuff that no one else is writing about. And, uh, and, and, and it was like, it, it led, like I tell people, I feel like I got a master's in Chicago because when you write about things like soccer and 16 inch softball, you really go into the neighborhoods, you really learn the ethnic groups. And I think maybe there's a little bit of a lifelong learning concept to it. You can learn a lot through sports. I think if you look beyond the, Hey, Hey, Holy mackerel sort of stuff, I think. All right. Let, let's talk about sort of the timing of this. So, so where are we talking sort of sir? Sure, because we're sure. also talking about a, a period of time when being a newspaper writer, especially mm -hmm. at a Chicago Tribune, which mm -hmm. was at the time clearly much more than what it, the shell of its of its current self, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. A major, mm -hmm. you know, newspaper and a competitive one at that. So maybe a little bit of sort of what what era is this sort of circa that you're sort of getting all of your your reps, if you will, as a uh, player, as a basically writer. the the early 1970s. Um, I, I came to the Tribune in 1969. And I served my apprenticeship like every, almost everybody does. I worked on the copy desk. I edited other people's copy. Uh, I wrote headlines. Uh, and then I looked for little openings where I could raise my hand and go out and cover something on my own time, that sort of thing. I wrote a lot about Division Three athletics uh, because I was a Division Three guy, not as an athlete, but I went to a small liberal arts college. And um, so um, I loved writing about little things like Wheaton had a great soccer program. And they, they and but and you look at it and you say, oh, well, a great soccer Soccer program, they get say, yeah. And here's here's the here's the backside to it. Many of the kids are missionaries' kids because Wheaton has a strong outreach sort of Christian outreach sort of thing. And um, many of these kids grew up in Ghana, Africa, South America, whatever, while their parents were doing missionary work, and that's where they learned to play soccer. So I mean, I love to be able to peek behind the curtain and, and tell people stuff that maybe they didn't know before. So, what are you doing circa 1975 then? Okay. And how does this sting thing sure, sure. hit your radar? Is it mm -hmm. you volunteering, you being volunteered? Give us a little background on sort of like, do you stumble into this? What, what? As I remember, and I, I did, I, you know, we had beats. We had a lot of beats at the Tribune and we had semi beats, things that maybe were, 
you know, like a bowling tournament would come to town every, you know, twice a year. Well, we had a guy that was the bowling guy, but it wasn't a full-time beat. Soccer wasn't a full-time beat. The first soccer game I probably ever saw was a sting game. And uh, it happened for me a lot of times. Tennis, the first tennis tournament I ever covered was a U.S. Open in New York. And the, the, the bottom line is there's certain principles you bring to it. You tell a story. You're the translator. You're a middle guy. You don't insert yourself into the story. And that's the way it was done in those days. And so these little things would keep popping up. For instance, there was always an urban league football game here every year among black schools from the South. I raised my hand. No one else was covering it. Sure, I'll go out and cover it. I was just hungry to, to, to get out and do stuff like that. The sting came. You know, it's going to be a beat. This is going to be it's going to be a, like a half beat in the sense that it's six months out of the year, perhaps. This was before indoor got started. And so, yeah, I raised my hand. And next thing I know, I'm the soccer guy, you know. And I grew to love it, too. As a matter of fact, I still follow it very closely in some in some regards. But uh, Well, we'll get into this a little bit, I think. But I'm sure not everybody on the staff sort of envisioned pro soccer, mm-hmm. this thing called pro soccer, which it had its... It's ups and certainly oh, yeah. major downs, right? So I don't think it was necessarily a gigantic get, so to speak, to get this beat per se, no, right? But no. I got to think that this was the beginning also of your, I don't call it advocacy, but mm-hmm. in many respects, right? How do you, by covering this beat and arguably seeing some of the story evolve, and we'll get into obviously some of the major things sure. that did evolve later on, sure. right? became obvious. How do you, how do you sort of manifest Mm-hmm. interest around not only the newsroom, but but elsewhere to get more lineage for your stuff mm-hmm. and the story. Well, I mean, first of all, you, I mean, anytime you write a story, you create drama. So, I mean, I'm not, I, I, the one thing I, I, I went, well, the one thing I did right off the bat was I'm not going to write in a way that it appeals to people that know a lot and a lot about soccer because they're not reading the Tribune to find out a lot and a lot about soccer. They just aren't. They, they, it's not going to happen, in the, at least for a while, unless the sting takes off. So I like to write, for, you know, like for the common denominator. I mean, the insulting thing is that people will say, well, you write for an eighth grade, you write for eighth grade audience kind of, you know. Well, I don't know if that's true or not, but I tried to hit the middle of the bar. I tried to apply concepts that people on the street could understand, like coming from behind, you know, the the... the David and Goliath sort of thing, uh, the big money, New York cosmos, uh, things like that, you know, and then I tried to get into the grassroots and the ground level of it too, at the same time, because what, what, what happened like with this thing too, and a lot of people don't know this, but in the very first years, the rules were such that you had to have at least four American, American U S born. Oh, I don't know if they were born, but U S citizens on, on the, uh, on the field at your team at your, on, on at all times. Well, Chicago was a good hotbed for for soccer talent for young kids that were born in the United States. There's a number of ethnic clubs around here that have development programs: Wiesla, the Lions, all these, the Maroons, uh, whatever. And so I got to know all of these guys, and I got to know a little bit about the Americans that were playing quite a bit actually. And so that was another thing. That was another little trick in the trick bag too, was to 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 make them a little bit more of a broad appeal because I felt like half the time I'm trying to, uh, uh, you know, make them an appealing story, not only to my editors, but to the readers too at the same time. And I was lucky because we had a sports editor at the time, a a gentleman who's still a friend, George Langford. And George was was all for this, you know. Now, if I had been under the regime before that, you know, I would have probably gotten about half the space. But when the Sting had that season in 81, we were page one there for a long time. That's a huge thing. And, um, you know, I mean, so... I did feel like there was some growth going on at the same time. And, and I always remember I had a, the, the NASL, the North American soccer league really was kind of a marketing. They always were trying to come up with marketing tricks and everything, you know? And I remember they, they, they put out this, uh, it was like a pad of scratch paper. And before you started tearing all the pieces off, it had the, it had the, it had the uh, saying soccer, soccer, the sport of the eighties. When a lot of my guys at work, they well, mean they mean the sport of the maybes, not the eighties. But but um, so and and so that helped. I mean, I could I could present some bona fide, you know. Uh, but another thing that you were up against too at the same time was that most of the players were foreign, and if you talk to um, you know, a bunch of guys from Germany running around. What do I care? A bunch of guys from England. But but now if you look at the makeup of sports, uh, I bet there's at least three or four guys from another country on an NBA team on uh, baseball. I mean, the White Sox are probably 50%, you know, and there's nothing wrong with that, but I'm just saying it makes a little bit of that sort of criticism that the sting face coming through when they did seem a little moot right now. I mean, they were maybe ahead of their time, you know? 
Well, so if you think back to what October 31st, 1974, this team is announced. I don't know when you sort of stumbled mm-hmm. across the beat or sort of got this half beat mm-hmm. uh, to your to yourself. But what are you thinking? And like, how do you start to go find out more about this team and this league and this situation, this owner? What are you? What are your first sort of steps to kind of mm-hmm. educate, yeah. immerse, and figure out what what this beat is going to be? Yeah. Well, I mean, f- first thing you do is you go to the coach. And they had a guy named Bill Folks that was coaching. And later, and then I find out he's like a legend in England. I mean, a legend. He survived a plane crash and came back and played like a few weeks later for Manchester United. And I had him up for dinner at our house. And, and, and probably if I, it wasn't a mistake, but he almost tried, sometimes it was easy to get too close to these guys. But, but what was interesting about it is that many of the players coming from foreign countries, they weren't used to talking to media in the locker room like they were here in the North American Soccer League. They did everything they could to get you all the access you could possibly want because they wanted every inch of publicity that they could get. And of course, we have to remember that the newspapers had much more sway in those days. There was no television of, of real consequence. The uh, um, Channel 11 used to actually do some of the games. And uh, Roy Leonard, who was a confirmed radio guy, but loved soccer, we used to do the play-by-play. But I mean, the point being that there was very little television and it was almost all print, but print carried a little more weight in those days. And when they started, you know, uh, drawing some crowds, because that's the first barometer you look at. Uh, and so when I went, I mean, I, I, one of the things I always did was I always put the crowd count in there. And because uh, I thought that was an important thing that people people were watching. I got close to the coach and then you had a language problem with many of the players, which so I me- immediately gravitated more towards the guys that could were fluent in English. And thank goodness this thing tended to be a lot of Brits, although two people separated by a common language, of course, that's the, uh, the, old, the old saw about that. And uh, but I found the players to be really accessible and uh, love to talk and, you know, tell about themselves and all that sort of stuff. So it was it was really not hard to find stories if you were at all a newsman, and I approached it that way. And like a lot of things, I mean, sometimes you have to search to find stories. My problem was I had so many good stories that, you know, I had to sell them to my editor still at the same time because they just sometimes weren't willing to allot all that much space to it. So how about this owner, this guy named Lee Stern? Uh, I got to think he was probably one of the first people that you met in all this and, sure, and probably sure. unbridled enthusiasm at oh, the yeah. very beginning, right? Sure, for sure. Yeah, no, Lee Lee was great from a standpoint of a, of a, of a beat guy because um, he was outspoken and, and it really wasn't between me and him, but me as the representative of the media, I had a different set of priorities than he did. His was to always present soccer as a positive, positive thing. Well, that's that's kind of hard to do sometimes because there's some backstories here that, that make that difficult. For instance, one of the soccer players they had on the team, maybe I'll keep him nameless, I don't know. He, he was a big star in Germany, but I found out there was a period in his career where he was playing in South Africa for a couple of years, and I never could quite figure that out. And it turned out that he had been on a team in Germany that threw a game. So it was part of the relegation process, they were trying to help out a team that was below them, that if they won that game, they would move up to the premier, you know, the top league the next year. And they were discovered. And so he got banned from the Bundesliga for like a couple of years. And he went to South Africa, which didn't belong to FIFA at the time. They weren't part of the international organization because all South American or South African athletics were outcasts. So, and you could play there. He could go down there and play on a pro team and get paid. You know, so there were a lot of guys that brought a lot of, you know, a lot of supposedly baggage, you know, to, to the, to this thing. And there was no shortage of stories like that. It's also interesting too, having looked at some of your earliest columns in the 75 season, right? Where you could sort of see the beginnings of it. You were, you, the crowd count, right? I think mm-hmm. one of your first articles you talked about, uh, I think there was a paragraph here. It says uh, perhaps the most discouraging note of all to sting management was the crowd since there was only 4,536 on hand. Mm-hmm. It was less fans than attended the debuts of the pro Mustangs mm-hmm. and Spurs in 1967, right? Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. I'm sure mm-hmm. Lee Stern was hugely yeah. <laughs> upset by maybe sort of that. But 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 it was it was tough going, right? It was yeah. very tough going to get fans and folks interested in this I, thing, right? I had an obligation to to be a reporter. I was a reporter first, and and you can't be a journalist, especially today. But in those days, and you're not you're gonna and I don't want to use the word you're gonna pee off somebody 
with your story. You can write the most straightforward story in the world, but someone's going to be irritated with it because A, you didn't take the angle that they wanted to. And I think Lee, being new to ownership, kind of thought, well, hey, I'm putting up the money. I should be able to control, you know, I should be able to control everything about this organization, including its face as represented in the media. Well, that didn't work that way. And ultimately, you're better off. I mean, he's better off having the truth be told because, uh, you know, if, if you make it out to be like some big, huge thing and you're lucky to have a ticket and you go there and you see 4,000 people there, your, your attitude towards the team is, gonna, is not going to be quite as positive as it was before. Well, so, so, so what's your, give us a sense of sort of that sort of first couple of seasons and, and you know, you're mentioning uh, uh, sort of a team that obviously was going to be English or British right. influence, right? Given, right? given the coach and, and all of that. And it seems like that, you know, Lee was pretty deferential to his coach to kind of sort of come up with the right sort of scenarios and stuff. But again, it's had to be tough given the relatively sparse crowds. And I got to think at the same time back in the office, Mm -hmm. right? How are you able to kind of grease the skid, so to speak, to kind of get the stories that you're sort of seeing that are so rich actually in in the uh, in the paper, given that there's so many other competing sports mm-hmm. interests in this in this city, and, and guaranteed, you know, mm-hmm. much more, you know, well attended and and followed than this fledgling soccer thing. You you two things here. Um, first of all, and this is a good history lesson for people. Chicago was in the dark ages of sports at this time in the early '70s, and they they hadn't when they the Sting finally won the championship in '81. I think it had been something like almost 20 years since Chicago had ever won a championship in anything. And, and that was 63, maybe, I think, was it the Blackhawks or the Bears or whatever. And the, the Chicago teams were just terrible then. And they weren't getting the coverage. They didn't get the, the usual coverage. Well, first of all, they didn't get the coverage they get today, the, the major pro sports teams. But, but you know, they were fighting a little bit among themselves to get on page one, too. So, so I mean, so the Sting, that benefited the Sting in a way. For instance, when they won the championship, if you if someone were to tell you, in the seventies, there would be a victory parade down LaSalle street with, you know, a million people cheering the sting. They would say you were nuts. Well, that actually occurred, but part of the strength of it was there was nothing else to cheer for in Chicago. I mean, the teams were really in the toilet during most of that era. The bulls kind of made some runs at it, that sort of thing. I mean, that, that was one thing that, you know, that, 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 kept it possible for the sport for, for, for continued coverage of them because there just really wasn't any other competition. But if the Chicago sports teams had been really good at that time, the sting would have suffered from it. I mean, cause that would have been the first thing to go, I think. Uh, uh, and that was a, that was a, you know, and, and the other thing too about the early days, and this is something else you learn about soccer that I started to get halfway, you know, nuanced about, but uh, the English play kind of a boring type of soccer. And Americans won a lot of goals. And if you if you go back, unless there was a championship at stake, the games that created the most excitement were the, the Sting played that game in, in Wrigley Field where it was like six to five or something like that. And the, 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 the Brits in those days, and they weren't, the teams weren't as international, the, the national teams. I mean, like the, the British Premier Leagues and all those, they, they tended to be British. I mean, it was really rare when somebody came in from the outside, like Argentina or Spain or something like that, and introduced a more exciting way to play. Well, the Brits were kind of down the excitement ladder a little bit. They, they, they tended to hit the long ball, knock it into a group of people and hope that somebody heads it into the goal. And they were a country of goalkeepers too, which is a, is another big thing to think about. And I started to learn all these things. And then the, the real Renaissance started when they, when, and the there was a guy named George Fishwick who was kind of the he was he was from England, as I recall. And he was kind of the the player personnel guy for Lee because Lee understood that, you know, I've got to have some help here with finding players and signing them to contracts. And um, I think the, and George was from he was from the UK. I don't know if it was Wales or England or Northern Ireland. But but the simple fact is he started importing what he knew best. And some of them were good. There was a guy named Gordon Hill that played there. He was 18. He went back to England, and became a huge star playing for Manchester United. But they either got kids that were out of the development st- development programs and came over here for the summer to play, because you have to remember most of the international seasons were, well, fall and winter. They didn't play that much during the summer sometimes, the regular leagues. We either got guys over the hill, you know, trying to cash a few paychecks at the end, or we got kids. And, and they were, you know, and we had the Brits we were getting a style of play that wasn't all that super exciting. And then, and then when you started to get the German players and Willie Roy comes in and you got the Dutch players 
and and they subscribe to the total soccer theory where it's all out everybody can score everybody's attacking attack 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 and that's when things i think you know a they became more successful because they got good players and b um it was a style of soccer that was much more appealing to people there were so many more shots and goals aside from those games with the cosmos which tended to draw some some great crowds uh, by everywhere everywhere not just in chicago because of, of pele's presence in 75 76 sure. 77 how does how does this first couple of years sort of evolve? Because it seems like it's it's becoming not only a bit dour on the field. I mean, mm-hmm. the play wasn't all that bad, but it wasn't all that good either. Sure. And it was it seems like it was also increasingly difficult to quote unquote sell right. to get people, even the casual fan who might be interested. I mean, I, is this around the time, let's say 77, 78, when the sort of wanderlust around where to play home games kind exactly. of started. Yeah, you hit it. You hit it right on the head there because uh, I think another thing is, if you see eight thousand people in a stadium like Soldier Field, it's a depressing scene. And, and I, to be fair, a lot of those European games don't necessarily draw big crowds either sometimes, but um, it's a depressing scene and they never really had a home. I mean, they played in Wrigley Field, they played in Soldier Field, they played in White Sox Park. They even had some exhibition games in Hanson Park and Fullerton on the north side of the city. And um, so, you know, they never really had a home. I, I, I laugh when I see that uh, the current soccer team wants to move out of their team or out of their stadium. If the Sting had had a stadium like that, it would have been unbelievable, I think, you know, because they just... They, even in that location, which some people think is, is not good for a pro team, but um, they needed a home like that and they never had that. And I think that had a lot to do with sort of the early years, the small crowds. I mean, you know, um, you go to Soldier Field and uh, I, I remember once, uh, th- this is more than what you want, but a number of years ago, I covered a, a football game at uh, Soldier Field. UIC used to have a football team and I covered a game and they played in Soldier Field. And they played, one year they played a a small college from Iowa named Luther College. And I wrote a story, I took pictures and I wrote a story for the Des Moines Register as a stringer. And there were like maybe 2,000 people in Soldier Field. And this was when Soldier Field was big. It's not the the circle that it is now. And the headline read, the day Luther College played in Soldier Field, and anyone could have a seat on the 50 yard line. <laughs> and I mean, it was almost that way with soccer. I mean, and it, why would you buy an expensive ticket when you knew from history and you'd gone there, I can sit anywhere I want, you know? So it was a big, you know, and I thought sometimes the exhibition games they played were more exciting than some of the regular season games too. I mean, they played Cuba in the middle seventies, Cuba. I mean, if that were to happen today, everybody would get all excited about it. You know, they were another example of being ahead of their time. But well, th- and that was a big deal, that game. I mean, and that was also probably one of the hallmarks of uh, the general manager who Lee brought in by the sure. guy, a guy named Clive Toy, who's been right. a, a honest on this show. Sure. And we've talked about obviously his time, mostly with the Cosmos, a little bit of the blizzard and, and just mm-hmm. a slight bit with the sting. But that was that was a, a concoction of of toys, right? Being almost sort of the quintessential True. Uh, promoter, shall we say, mm-hmm, of, of mm-hmm. the game. Um, maybe that's a good sort of segue because it seems like that's when some real attempts to kind of shake things up a little bit, both mm-hmm. on the field as well as perhaps off the field. True. And it didn't go very well. It seems no. like in those seventy seven, seventy eight seasons. Yeah. I, I, you know, for what reasons I can't tell you, but I mean, I, I know that the newspapers tended to not do anything at all very exciting about them at the time when they made some of those, they played some of those exhibitions. And as you alluded to, they weren't just all that successful. And soccer's a different sport too, because exhibition games, some of those exciting exhibition games, they're not always what they're cracked up to be either because sometimes the star players stay back. They don't want to get hurt, that kind of stuff, you know, and they, t- they call them friendlies for the most part. So that right off the bat, that sort of puts you in a hole if you're trying to sell tickets. They're playing a friendly uh, with somebody. And, uh, but Toy, you know, Toy was a, Clive was a, I really like Clive and he was a, he was a good guy and he was exciting, but I sometimes think that he needed a little bigger budget to do the sort of stuff that he really wanted to do. And, um, and I think I think that kind of he was a little hamstrung when he was here, uh, and he, and he's just totally the opposite of what Lee was. Lee was excitable, and Clive, you know, you could set off a bomb on the next block, and and you know, and he would he would take it in stride and and move right on along and everything. But he was a delight to cover too because he loved being around the media, and and of course coming from New York, you know, he he was he was really into he knew he knew what would play and what wouldn't play with the media. And he played, you know, he was, he was great to cover. Well, he also brought in a new coach, Malcolm Musgrove, which 
also didn't go all that right. well, right? Because I think in 1978, right, the the team, if I have this correct, I think they kind of – was it 0-10? Yeah. It was it was just a disastrous start in 78. Right. And if I have my, my data correct, I don't know if it was 77 or 78, the, I think the Sting had the lowest attendance Probably. of any team in the league. So yeah. I, what do you remember of that of that kind of time? Because I got to think that it's at that, at that around this time, and I think I've seen a little bit of bits and pieces that Lee Stern's probably thinking, I, I, what do I have to do and why am I doing this to myself? Yeah. I mean, first of all, just to, to back up, don't put too much stock in attendance figures. They almost all were lower than what they were saying, too. That makes it that makes the situation even worse. I think. Uh, I don't. I don't think. I don't know. I I can't recall. There was thoughts along the line of, well, Lee's going to bag it and just fold up the team and all that kind of stuff. That never seemed to be a factor, because one of the things that that kind of went into the strength of the franchise was the strength of the league. And, and they still were expanding in some cases. And um, so that helped. And I don't know what kind of pooling they would do of resources among owners and teams. But so that never really was was quite a factor, you know, that, oh, my guys, they're, they're not going to. And frankly, I'm a newspaper guy. If they fold, they fold. That's a story. But um, but Lee was just, you know, he kind of dug in his feet, you know, and just became even more determined, you know, to, to make it go. But but Malcolm and I, I don't know that I think sometimes that. Clive Toy came here kind of because I don't know how much Lee had to do with that too. Yeah, his son Kenny had a lot to had a lot of influence, and uh, I think everybody thought, you know, well, if he's he's the very successful the Cosmos, he'll come here and do the same thing. Lee, I think, was thinking more along, well, how much is this going to cost me? You know, because he's giving these guys a lot of big salaries, and I'm sure that Clive would probably say, well, you can only do with what you've given to do in his budget. You know, and they were getting a lot of players that really, in retrospect, weren't all that good, and Malcolm was probably and Malcolm didn't last very long either, so that had a lot to do with it. And the irony is, and I don't want to steal the thunder here, but when they go, when they went the other way, they went more local. It probably was cheaper too at the same time. Well, let, let's let's talk about Willie Roy in, in, in yeah. name, right? Because he was, I think, that at the time the assistant coach under Musgrave. Yeah, yeah, he was an assistant coach. Yeah. So, but and, and in my understanding, my read of it was that that Lee, maybe through the influence of, of Kenny or, or some others, kind of essentially overruled Clive and basically said that Willie's going to be our, our coach. I, obviously, in in hindsight, right, that mm-hmm. became a just short of brilliant move because mm, sure. Willie was the guy who basically made, you know, yeah. all of the things sort of kind of gel, but maybe a little bit about Willie Roy in the early days, your first inklings and maybe your reminiscences mm. or your thoughts about maybe from the assistant ranks comes this guy who ultimately will lead them out of the darkness. And, <laughs> and who was under his, under Lee's nose all that time. I mean, he's a local guy. And I mean, he played for the U.S. national team. He was probably one of the most honored uh, local soccer players, American soccer players for the U.S. national team. And here he was all this time, the guy right underneath. Who And I, 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 I'm sure that when they gave the job to Willie, they didn't necessarily think this was going to work out the way it did. And 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 but Willie had these connections. For one thing, he, he had a lot of players. I think when I think some of the the better players that came in, like Arno and Carl and all those guys, you know, they see Willie. And they see a, a, a kinsman. I mean, they see someone that's German, Teutonic, just like they are, too, at the same time. And even though this probably wasn't part of the strategy or the reason why they hired Willie, he favored a type of play, the, the total soccer that appealed. And then you start getting all these good German players. And frankly, that's if they'd have done that sooner, you know, because they, they struggled, you know, and they, there were some seasons where it was pretty bad. But, but it was this, this sort of turning German, I guess, or Northern European is, is really what it did. And Willie, as it turned out, could uh, he could speak the language of the players because he'd been a player. And Willie always had a little bit of a chip on his shoulder, too, because I think, you know, you're an American soccer player and you score goals on, in national teams and World Cup qualifying and stuff like that, even though we didn't go anywhere much in World Cup in those days. Uh, you know, you got a little chip on your shoulder, you know, and Willie was, you'd go to practices, you'd see him out there practicing with the players, you know, just as much as uh, you'd never saw that before, you know, and he was, uh, he was kind of a player's guy in some ways. But, uh, you know, another little thing too, and I don't want to keep piling on here, but even though the crowd, one of the things about this thing too is, they turned out some good front office people. Uh, I mean, you've got, uh, you, know, you know, they had, they had guys that became, that went to work. You got uh, John uh, you know, at the, running the Blackhawks right now, you know, and, and they had several other people like that too, that got good jobs. So it was, it was kind of a neat 
thing. And they had good marketing people too. So it wasn't like that was the problem. I think, you know, that they, they weren't drawing crowds, but uh, McDonough. Well, yeah. And, and it's, it's, it's also interesting too, because there's Chicago, such a, a big and, and diverse market, right? You'd think that you know, there would have been a little bit more of an uptake, but you're mentioning the league, obviously it's growing. You've mm -hmm. got the Pele scenario. You've got some national television coming into play, but it does seem that right 1978, almost uh, well-timed, I guess, given mm -hmm. all those sort of sort of outliers or things outside of the Chicago Stings uh, direct control. But it's, I, th mm -hmm. I also think it's ironic too, that Musgrove really kind of didn't get to see sort of the fruits of his early season labor because right. If I'm not mistaken, he was kind of responsible for maybe through the efforts of Clive as well, allowing mm -hmm. him to go to Europe to go search for talent. Mm -hmm. He brought back some big time talents to right. circa 78. Sure. That sure. that kind of led sort of to this, if you will, Der Sting, right? Sort mm -hmm. of this mm -hmm. sort of German influence. And, and you mentioned some names. Maybe we should go into some of those names now. Mm -hmm. uh, Karl Heinz Granitza and Arno Stefan. I mean, these are these are big names that ultimately mm -hmm. became the linchpin for what became a roaring success years later. Right. And, and, and there were some Brits too. I mean, uh, Derek Spaulding was a key part of uh, some of the success later on and pretty sure he came in around with Musgrove. I'm not sure. Davey Hewson was another one that was, uh, and, but it's ironic and uh, not ironic, but it's, it's interesting that the Brits that were there and Phil Parks was a goalie for a while. Um, the, the Brits that were there though, kind of played the style of play too. the total soccer. Davey Houston was a, was a defender, a fullback, but he loved, was a guy that loved to come forward all the time. And so the ones that stayed were the ones that kind of fit, fit, fit the pattern. But, but Carl Heinz was the goalkeeper and a uh, goal scorer. And, uh, Arno Steffenhagen was probably my favorite because I, I always thought he was kind of the unsung hero of the whole thing. He was the guy that would distribute the ball where it needed to be and that sort of thing. And, uh, uh but yeah, Willie, Willie opened up the gates ahead. I kind of remember, I can't remember, can't remember if it was around that time. Thomas Schoberg was there. Uh, he was a Swedish national. Um, and then, of course, Pato was the guy that everybody loved to watch play. I mean, he was he was like the Denny Savard of of the uh, of the Sting. I mean, he he, he and I I'll always remember this uh, when Pato came in. He was like a 19 year old kid who had uh, played for Detroit for a year, but he had played for Boca Juniors Development or something in in South America. But um, uh, I always remember this. He, 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 they had an exhibition one year against Milan AC came here and uh, he just dazzled them. And after the game, they made an offer for him, to, you know, to, to, so Lee wouldn't sell him. And, and I think Lee sort of started to become a little more aware of these players as commodities. You know, a little of the Charlie Finley selling and buying players, too, might not be a bad field to be in because he had some real budding talents there, no question. Well, and you mentioned that. I mean, Lee Stern, obviously, being a commodities yeah. guy is, is, yeah. is, is, is his real job. And, and that's it's a very interesting thing because you start to see. But I also get, get the sense, too, that he also recognizes that you know, quality talent, sure, a la the sure. Pele's of the world, right, are going to cost money. And right. and the Cosmos, right, probably the the ultimate expression of that. Right. You wonder, I maybe I wonder, maybe your sort of recollections around so, that time, the Cosmos were kind of hoovering up everything, it oh, seemed. They had, they had world-class players at every position, you know. And I mean, it truly was the David and Goliath when they met in, in many ways. I mean, I mean, the, the Sting was, you know, kind of a hard scrabble outfit sort of, I mean, they, for, they, they, you know, they had a lot of things going for them and they were, they were probably the equal of any other NASL in the front office, but the Cosmos were just, I mean, Jim Trecker and all these guys, the show they ran. I mean, I, I can remember every time you played the Cosmos, you could count on calls from them and any material you need and all this kind of stuff. And I remember when the sting and this jumped forward a little bit, but when they went to the soccer bowl, the first time against the Cosmos, it was so striking the difference between the two teams approach to it off the field. I mean, the sting, I mean, and you know, you know, the little press releases you got and everything, they were nice. But then, and, and, and you know, you turn around, here's the cosmos, you know, with books and pictures and videos and whatever you need. And you're taking, you know, they had banquets and you know, thing for everybody, you know, I mean, it, well, it was Warner communications. So, I mean, it was a real David and Goliath sort of thing. And, uh, you know, but the, but, but the sting, you know, persevered. <laughs> well, you say persevered. It's also very interesting too, that, that I think uniquely, right. So, the Sting, in many respects, for many years, including and probably ultimately in 1981 when they won the Soccer Bowl, had the Cosmos number on on just yeah. about every major occasion, yeah. regular season, playoffs, exhibitions, whatever it might have been. Yeah. What do you, I mean, what was that all about? I mean, I got to think that also helped maybe burnish a little bit of the image here in the city right. as the team kind of got a little bit more... Mm -hmm 
exciting, a little bit more attractive to people to come see. Yeah, well, let's separate France Matthew and Giorgio Canale and put that aside. No, I'm just kidding. But because uh, that was a matchup that did a lot to uh, uh, equalize uh, the, the, the two teams. But um, uh, yeah, that was that was an ongoing thing. And of course, I mean, you know, it's the old Chicago versus New York. I mean, everybody loves that sort of scene. It's it's sort of died out now a little bit. But even if you go back to the 60s and 70s and 80s, it still was a big thing when you played Chicago. And of course, in baseball, there was no interleague play. So you didn't get some of, even more of the stuff that you're getting even more of the stuff right now than you got then. But that was a big deal. But it, but but it clearly was. I mean, there was no getting around it. It was big money against, you know, the guy that the, the, the little team that could sort of, and Lee loved to play to that, loved to play to that. And, and he was justified in doing it. I think, I mean, uh, was it Ahmad Erdogan? I think was the uh, Warner guy and they love soccer too. And, but, but I think maybe just a little bit of that goes down to, you can have all the all-stars you want, you can put them on the field, but will they play as a unit, you know, and the, and the core of the sting was really strong though. I mean, Arno and Carl up the middle and, and Pato out there drilling all over the place and Jurgen Christensen doing his thing, dazzling them, and they had good midfielders and good defenders. France back there, Houston. I mean, it, you know, they, they had a real unit, and, you know, and so they just played better together, is the only explanation I can think of. All right, we'll be back with uh, our conversation in just a couple of seconds. But first, uh, a little commercial message from our friends at Manscaped, the number one resource for men's below the belt grooming. Yep, Manscaped, they offer precision engineered tools for your family jewels. And that's not just a slogan, friends. You know, I can't tell you uh, how challenging it can be. And I'm, I'm sure you guys out there in listener land, you know what I'm talking about. You know, that. Uh, you know, the package, so to speak, downstairs, you know, below the belt, it's, um, you know, it gets a little unwieldy once in a while. And, you know, I think uh, one's partner uh, can always uh, benefit by uh, not having to deal with the uh, thicket and the musty aromas and uh, the other sort of uh, untoward things that uh, potentially are, are part of the mix down there. And uh, Manscaped, it's a brilliant company. It's a tremendous idea. And, you know, they've got tremendous uh, products to, to bring to uh, the well-groomed man or one who frankly needs to be. The electric trimmer, they've redesigned it. They call it their new one, the Lawn Mower 2.0. It's got proprietary skin-safe technology, so the trimmer won't nick or snag your private parts. Manscaping accidents are finally a thing of the past, and uh, trust me, I've used the product. And boy, oh boy, it's, uh, let's put it this way, it's a hell of a lot better than using what you use on your face to keep yourself trim, shall we say. Manscaped also has the Crop Preserver. Love that name. It's uh, the an anti-chafing deodorant and moisturizer for that matter for, you know, that sensitive area down there, right? You put deodorant on your armpits or under your armpits. Why not think about uh, perhaps uh, gussying up, shall we say, fragrantly in a deodorant-like manner uh, for your other sort of areas that, you know, a little bit more, shall we say, personal and, uh, and private. At Manscaped, it's tremendous. They've got a whole range of products. I highly encourage you to check them out. I have been fascinated by this company and the products that they offer. And uh, our listeners can get 20% off their first purchase, including, by the way, free shipping when you use the code GOODSEATS at manscaped.com. Again, that's 20% off and free shipping when you use the code Good seats at Manscaped. That's M A N S C A P E D. Manscaped, past tense.com. Manscaped.com. And uh, you'll uh, always have the right tools for the job, if you know what I mean. And uh, you want to keep yourself neat and clean and trim down there? By all means, it's Manscaped. Again, 20% off and free shipping when you use the code Good Seats at Manscaped.com. Again, Manscaped.com. Promo code Good Seats for 20% off and free shipping. And we thank our friends at Manscaped and we thank you for listening to the rest of our conversation coming up right now. Let's talk about the rest of the league at this point, too, because sure. you're obviously seeing the league, you know, grow by leaps and bounds, right. uh, arguably how solid or not we can mm -hmm. debate and discuss. But in your travels, uh, how much traveling were you able to do as a, as a Tribune reporter? Yeah. Were you able to go on those road games? Were you able to kind of get a sense of not only the Cosmos, but how the other teams were faring and maybe kind of in your own mind juxtapose 
yeah. where the Sting were sort of in the milieu of sure. all these other teams? Like, where were they? Was the Sting, I mean, you mentioned the front office mm-hmm. was strong and stuff, but they weren't the weakest or the the most shaky of teams, no, were they? they? Weren't. Although the league was starting to shrink a little bit. I think the year they won their first championship, as I recall, there were a couple of teams fewer than there were the year before. But um, when you're in late 70s, so right? so yeah. 78, 79, oh, yeah, okay. 80, we're talking about like 24 teams. Right, and right. I, I'm just curious about what your remember sure. your experiences were sort of with those those teams and, and those sure. other markets around the country sure. versus what you saw in Chicago. Sure. I, I uh, as a beat guy and, you know, this thing being a beat and by this, you know, as it went, it went on, it was a full time beat. That's all I paid my attention to. Uh, but as, as a beat guy, you measured how much your bosses thought about it by how many road games they sent to you, how much money were they willing to spend? Because it's one thing to cover somebody in Soldier Field and you're, you know, you're charging them 20 cents a mile on gas or something, you know, to get there. But, but it's another thing to fly to another city. And there were a couple of years where I didn't make any trips on the road. And like that, the year they lost all the games or whatever. And, but there were years that, you know, I could sell them and they, they saw the wisdom in it. And I made a few trips every year, except for a couple. And, until the end. And then the end, I was going all the time. I was a regular commuter to San Diego for a while. But, um, and I would go down to St. Louis and back in a day sometimes to cover a game, fly down. I went up to Minneapolis. I went to Detroit. I went to places that were kind of close. If there was some kind of a real matchup that, that I could sell it and it was late in the year and there was something really at stake. But one of the things that's kind of a, the dirty little secret is you develop a real core of media guys in other cities that help you out. Like I, I, there, there was a guy named Steve Schoenfeld in Tulsa, the Tulsa Roughnecks. And they were fun to watch because they were mean and, you know, they played hard Scottish, you know, kick them in the shin, Italian, uh, uh, you know, type defenses and all that well, sort of stuff. And, and the, the field that they played on too, Skelly Stadium was no right. picnic, right? It was very, right, right, know. right. Yeah, absolutely. And Steve and I, and, and there were a bunch of others. There was a guy in Kansas City named Randy Kovitz. They had a team. Now, this might have been more with the indoor than the outdoor. I can't recall, which is another story. I think that's right. Yeah. Comments. Yeah. And, yeah. and we, we got, you know, we and, and one of the things that got started, and I was one of the founders of it, was a thing called PSRA, the Professional Soccer Reporters Association. It was me and a guy in Tampa Bay. That name slips me, but we, we, we sort of, we sort of started banding together. There was a guy in Rochester and we would all call each other, you know? And so like, even though I wouldn't be making the trip, say to Dallas or something, I had somebody I could call down there and get some good information above and beyond what the team wants to tell you, which is what you're always looking for, you know? And so you do sort of develop that network. And then sometimes when you would make the trips, you'd rec- you know, buy the guy dinner or whatever, you know? Uh, and, you know, we had, it was a, it was a real uh, kind of a union of us. Uh. Yeah. We've had Michael Lewis on uh, oh, yeah, up in sure. Rochester. He was and the treasurer of the first PSR. Sure. And, and that's also, so that's also interesting too. I, I almost felt like it was maybe sort of a I don't know, unionization kind of thing, but maybe sort of a legitimizer, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Especially, I guess, in the eyes of your editors, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. right? Respective editors. And, sure. you know, in New York and, you know, maybe here in Chicago because of your efforts, but I got to think that it wasn't necessarily always the easiest sell yeah. to get the stories and the teams on the local papers mm-hmm. front pages. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, the thing is, it was such a uh, polyglot of cities. I mean, a pro team in Tulsa is going to be a bigger deal than a pro team in Chicago. And you go down there and it was like, you know, it's page one and all that kind of stuff. Uh, Portland, Oregon, you know, it'd be a bigger deal out there than it would be in other cities, you know. And uh, so you're always running into that, you know, where, where you know, and and it would be astounding to me sometimes to go and see it's a big story, you know. But but with, with the Sting, the Sting had to be successful in Chicago, though, or their their space would start to shrink a little bit and shrink a little bit. And I, I've never done this, but I bet you could go back and look in those seasons when they were terrible, you know, that by the end of the year, they were barely covering the home games, I think, you know, if there was a competition with something else. But uh, uh, but they were still, you know, getting in. But they But you didn't see anything, you hardly ever saw anything in any newspaper – uh, and I feel justified in talking about newspapers because they were really carrying the weight, but you never saw almost anything in a newspaper in a major city that didn't have a soccer team about soccer, though. I mean, uh, that was the difference between, I mean, if you go to, in the old days when, say, uh, Tampa Bay didn't have a major league team, but you picked up the Tampa Bay paper, you'll still see the baseball scores and the standings and a little bit of a wire service sort of stuff. And we used to get sort of second level wire service guys. They were stringers. They weren't the full-time guys coming out. And so the stuff sometimes just didn't get the play going across the syndications on the wires. But uh. 
too much inside there. No, that, this is this is great. I mean, we, we really want to go deep on this stuff because so 79, though, seems to be kind of like a turning point, right? Because mm-hmm. in terms of like the, the, the crowds, I mean, it's almost doubling in size. Um, I don't know if exactly this is when sort of the decision was made to kind of split uh, the the games between Wrigley and, and Comiskey, but yeah. is there anything sort of that you could get a glean, a sense, or a member of sort of like what sort of started to kind of kick into gear, whether in terms of yeah. fan consciousness or... or it, was, it was a bit like, you know, when the Bulls made a couple of close stabs at getting to the finals with Detroit, when they were fighting out with Detroit and all those times, it was like each year they're getting a little closer. They're getting, so there was a little bit more attention paid. There's a little bit more attention. One year they sent me, I think the year, I think it was, it might've been the 81 year, they sent me down to spring training for this thing in Florida. I mean, you know, not only was I covering games, but I was, I was going to their training, their training in, in Florida. And as I recall, and you got all the statistics, but I think the year before 81, 80 was a pretty successful year too. There was one run in there where they made a pretty good run in the playoffs and came within a game or two of maybe going to the finals or whatever. And uh, they developed a big rivalry with San Diego there for a while, which was enhanced by the fact that their goalie was from Germany, Volkmar Gross, and it was, it was a fun thing to watch all the time. But, um, but so there was definitely a mounting thing. And by the time that they came to go to the soccer bowl, um, I, there was no doubt, but what, you know, we were going to give them full coverage. We sent a columnist too, as I recall, and, uh, and the columnists started showing up, uh, which is a Rick Talley, who a lot of people don't know about, but used to be a really a prominent sports columnist for the Tribune. He used to love to come out and write about him. Co- Dave Condon would throw some stuff in the column once in a while about him, but a lot of it's centered around Lee Stern because he was kind of the, still kind of the, the face of the team at the same time. And uh, I think even Bill Gleason from the Sun Times started coming out. And to me, that was the real barometer. And you never saw that. You never saw that until basically until the 79, 78, 79 on into it. Then. So, well, it was also the first year of the indoor game, 80, right. 81, which was the NASL's first sort of real, yeah. I guess, response to the MISL, which had sort of yeah. grown out of nowhere yeah. three years prior. So yeah. in some respects, I guess you also had now more of a year round reason to sure. cover and or if you're Lee Stern in the front office, mm-hmm. promote the team. Right. And uh, obviously the indoor thing itself caught on even right. independent of the outdoor. But I got to think that that 79 into 80 season with that indoor loop yeah. didn't hurt things in terms of keeping the, the interest the level. Up. You still got to, you know, you still got to, you still got to write, they're still going to be in the paper and they would never have been in the paper otherwise too. And in, in the off season, I, that, that, uh, you know, interesting, the MISL, I'm pretty sure Jim Walker was the first general manager who used to be the general manager who I think replaced Clive Toy or maybe he, rep- yeah. Or Charlie Avranian, one of the two. And the MISL knew what they were doing with the game. They knew how to play the game, indoor soccer. And, and it was just hilarious the first year or two at the NASL tried to play indoor and they were getting good crowds and everything. But, but Willie, I think I've never seen a coach so exasperated after him line changes. I mean, you know, I mean, he'd never, he, I mean, soccer is a very uh, sort of a cerebral sport in the way you throw your guys out there and you really don't have a whole lot of control over what goes on. You yell a few instructions or something, but this stuff was constant motion. And some of the players really had trouble adjusting to it, but, 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 but the fans that were going were sting outdoor people. So they were adjusting to it too at the same time. And it, and it really worked. And I mean, I, they had a, some full houses out at the Chicago stadium. It was fun to watch. Well, how, how was it to cover indoor versus outdoor, right? Outdoor is a little bit more uh, languid and, and, you know, you get a chance to breathe. You can kind of see strategy develop, whereas this indoor yeah. thing, much more, you know, go, go hockey type, higher scoring, I mean, how did you and your editors look at this indoor, I don't know, maybe the first season, that 80-81 season, almost a diversion or escapade, right. supposedly, from this, you know, burgeoning outdoor team that was starting to really gain some steam? Yeah, yeah. I, I think the indoor, I, I mean, we covered it. It was a sting. And uh, I think my editors, you know, well, let's see what goes on here. But, but, but on the one hand, you had a lot of people that sort of the, the people that picked up on the sting in the end uh, were people that maybe didn't know that much about soccer. So in a way, the indoor is actually more appealing to them than it was the outdoor. And for me covering it, I mean, you know, it's pretty tough sometimes to write 
15 paragraphs on a one to nothing game, you know, which never happened in, in, in indoor. And I, I much preferred the indoor to cover, but I knew that a lot of the players were struggling with it because the European players, I, I don't think they'd almost ever encountered something like that before, you know, and cause they play in the winter and it was fun to watch them try to make the adjustments to it too, at the same time. But for me as a writer, I mean, it was, it was like basketball, you know, and I had constant flow of, you know, goals and, you know, fouls and, you know, penalty kicks and all that kind of stuff to write about. So I could fill up the story pretty easy. It, 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 for me, it always depended on the time of the day of the game, not to get too technical. But if, if I was in a situation where I didn't have to file what we call running as, you know, in other words, start filing for the early edition because its deadline is, comes towards the end of the game. Well, on a one to nothing game, that's pretty hard to be making up stuff, you know, to, to be writing about when there's nothing to write about. But this stuff, and if I was on a short deadline, it was perfect because I could start writing running from like the first kickoff almost, you know. So from a media standpoint, and I think I think that it I think that it got a lot of attention. But I think in the end, it was kind of considered a novelty, though, sort of, you know, and some people were like, well, you know, it's just an attempt to kind of like for Lee to get more mileage out of his players or on a year round contract, some of these guys and put them to work in the winter and that sort of stuff. And and um, but, you know, you, you, you also had these smaller stadiums. So people it's always the deal is the secret is if you've got a smaller stadium, it creates more demand for the tickets. I mean, if you've got Soldier Field and you've got 5,000 people there, you never buy a ticket in advance because you know it could rain, you know, and I bought a ticket in advance and there's 90,000 empty seats. And what am I doing? You go to the stadium, it's 17 or 16,000 people, you know, well, I better get it. You never know. That's 16,000 that could sell out, you know, pretty quick. And, you know, you're going to be high and dry sitting there watching the game. So I think a little bit of the creature comfort aspect uh, helped. Help sell the indoor. Well, I don't think anybody could have envisioned what the indoor game wound up becoming for the Sting in later years, right? Mm-hmm. Became basically their salvation and their escape valve. So sure. from this, you know, Absolutely. the demise of the NASL. But mm-hmm. um, maybe you can kind of regale our audience a little bit into your sort of recollections of that 1981 outdoor season, because that's where, for whatever reasons, it all sort of kind of came together and. I guess in retrospect, again, having not been here at the time, you know, it almost seems like that indoor season was almost a, a solid marketing kind of, mm-hmm. you know, seeding effort, if you will, that that kind of, you know, kicked in and was probably an element of of the ultimate success that 81 was outdoors, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But I, before we get into 81 and your recollections of the season and, mm-hmm. and what ultimately happened, I want to know, like, were you walking a little straighter and narrower in the in the and a little cockier perhaps in the newsroom where were you kind of benefiting from sort of this ebbing if you will of of this sting thing and you were the mm-hmm. beat guy right back yeah. when it wasn't fashionable to be so and all of a sudden maybe sure. not so all of a sudden but sure. you're the guy yeah well i think that for the most part from my peers there were going to be some that was just never going to accept soccer as a thing. You know, it's just as simple as that. And that's fine. I'm not, you know, they're, they're probably the same ones that, you know, didn't believe in title nine or, you know, things like that. And that that's fine. It's always going to happen, you know, whatever. But um, I think though, that I, I, I did notice that, you know, well, first of all, like I said, you usually measured your worth in, in the amount of money they spent on you to travel to follow the team. Well, that definitely got better. And I mean, and they would, my editors would ask me, well, you know, what do you think? Is it worth it if you, I send you to this, but we don't, we don't go to that. And I had much more command in what I would be doing. There was no question about that. And, um, and there were, there were some other guys that were writing about soccer a little bit too. Neil Milbert was a good friend of mine. He covered a little bit of it in the very early years too, but he, he was the horse racing guy. But, uh, and I, there were always people that would, in, that were interested, but I found one of the things that started to perk up a little bit. I usually drew more interest the, the people that, uh, like in the newsroom and in the sports department, you know, that would stop me once in a while and ask me about it. Well, what about this? Da, da, da. They generally were people who had kids playing soccer. And that was one of the things that I think was kind of a, a weird thing, you know, because there's no question but what soccer was really taking root in the high schools and stuff in, in, in the 1980s and the 1970s. But it didn't necessarily translate. Now, it, it was a good marketing thing for the Sting because they would, well, we're going to honor a high school team from Lions Township or something, and they'll come here, and, and we'll, their parents will come and all that. And so it was a good marketing thing to work. But it wasn't automatic that if you you had a direct contact with – I always told people it's like bowling. More people bowl than probably any other thing. Do they want to watch a bowling tournament? Not necessarily. And I think one of the things that the Sting did 
was they created a lot more excitement because they scored goals because the perception was, well, who wants to sit there through a one to nothing game, whatever they score. Most. So as I walked around the newsroom, you know, I, I started, it, it started to grow. I mean, you know, I mean, and I found myself out of the office a lot more than I ever was before. And sometimes I would be sent, like I, they sent me out to cover uh, Pelé's last game in Portland, Multnomah County Stadium. And uh, it was his last game as a professional with the Cosmos. And they were in the soccer bowl against somebody. I can't remember. It wasn't Chicago. And I thought, my golly, they're sending me to a game that, and that was George Langford. They're sending me to a game in which we have no direct vested interest in it. I mean, so to me, that was kind of like a, that was like a breaking point sort of. And, and there would be more people, but frankly, the better this thing got, the less I was in the office because I was at practice all the time. That was another thing. They practiced over at Northbrook and on the, on the, public property over there. And I spent a lot of time over there and w didn't even go into the office a, a lot of the season, but I would get questions about it. You know, I mean, no question. And, and it grew, there was interest growing, you know, and you know, if nothing else, they, again, they were successful while this great big dark hole of Chicago sports was, was there too at the same time. So, uh, uh, yeah, I know it was good. And I went from there to being the college beat guy. So, you know, whether that was, I mean, which is really what I ultimately really wanted to do. I covered the final fours and Rose Bowls and things like that. You know, so there was like a gradual sort of a, you know, if they just said to me, do you want to stay covering the sting or do you want to go with the college beat guy? I'm going the college beat guy, you know, and, but part of that was my own makeup because I like to just spread myself around and do lots of different things and everything. Well, so 81 was, was kind of the sort of last year that you sort of uh, were on the sting beat, right? So uh, I covered it the next year. Okay. And then, and there was a big failure. I don't know if they even made the playoffs in 82. I can't recall, but it was, it was quite a letdown from 81, but. Uh, well, let's, let's, let's talk about sort of, sort of what the, the sort of the, the ultimate result of 81, right? So mm -hmm. you're talking to somebody who was actually at that game in varsity stadium in, uh, sorry, exhibition stadium in Toronto. Toronto. Right. Um, but the game leading to it was the game. Well, okay. So let's yeah, talk yeah. about that because yeah. clearly the playoffs, especially the games here in Chicago, I think, I don't know if all, I guess the, some of the play, I guess they were split, split between Wrigley and Comiskey still at yeah. the time. Yeah. It seemed like that was almost like the, 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 the fuel that, that kind of got Chicago sort of smitten sure. and, and, and ready behind this team that had never been really before. Yeah. Well, I mean, there was kind of a boutique angle to it, too, just a little bit. It was kind of in to know a little something about this, too. And that I think that game at Wrigley Field, that 6-5 to five game, and it helped that it was New York because, obviously, you know, Chicago was beating New York. But but New York, you know, they they were classy about it, you know, and it was a big deal because they had a big following. And, and, and so that was probably one of the most exciting games played in the history of the NASL, 6-5. to five. And I think that... Uh, you know, I, I think that New York being a part of it, you know, that really, if it had been Vancouver and, uh, you know, uh, Tulsa, I don't think there would have been quite the excitement about it, you know. And New York, when you had New York, you had all these other people that were following them, too, at the same time. They could, people could relate to that. So um, that, was, that, was a, that was a big part of it. And, and by the way, for our, for our listeners, that was, that was in, uh, in June of 81. Uh, it was a 6-5 to five game. I think it was a franchise record at the time and maybe still stood at 30,501 at Wrigley Field. Mm -hmm. And if I'm not mistaken, I think Jim Trecker, the, the PR guy for the Cosmos, uh, actually produced or, or his uh, his team produced actually a, a highlight reel of that game. Right. And he lost, you know, so right. you know, as, <laughs> as the most exciting game in NASL history at that yeah. time. So yeah. it, was, it was again, they, again, you had the Cosmos number that probably was, you know, but then going into the playoffs, yeah. that, it, that seemed to be almost the, the, the catalyst, it seems to, right. to getting the, 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 the fans truly on board and, and the fan and the right. stands filled. Right. I, I would suspect that the, and I, I, I haven't looked at the figures, but the point from that game for the rest of the season, there was a marked uh, increase in the average attendance probably, you know, and, and, um, uh, yeah, no, and 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 the Cosmos are classy. I mean, they were a first class outfit, and the league owes everything to them. I think, and here you have, you know, here you have a team, and I know if you go to YouTube, you can find a lot of this stuff too. By the way, but but here you have a team that lost, you know, the the maybe the most exciting game in NASL regular season history. And they're making a, and they're making a, of course it might help that it was Warner brothers too, cause that's their business, but they're making documentaries on the thing, you know? And I mean, that's cool. I mean, that, that helps the sting too at the same time. But, uh, but that uh, attendance record was, was broken at the final playoff game, which was right. at Comiskey park. It was, it was like 39,000 for that game on a rainy weeknight. Yeah. It was no, not only a weeknight, it was a Monday night. Yeah. Right. Of right. all things. Right. right. So and rainy and overcast. Okay. And, 
you know. So what do you remember about that? Because that was the prelude. That was the, hey, we make this. We're in the soccer bowl. I mean, what, what was your, what was the well, feeling? That you remember? Well, I'll, I'll tell you one thing for sure. And you asked about a little bit about my personal dealings. I mean, I remember that press box. I saw faces I'd never seen before. And I mean, I mean, Lee was always inviting guests in and, you know, the mayor and that kind of stuff and everything. And, and I mean, I saw media and I mean, and, and here's, you know, there were media from out of town that didn't have a team playing that were there for that too, because well, you'd have the normal New York or not New York, but San Diego, which didn't have a whole lot of people, but you had people from LA times there. You had a guy come up in the Dallas times Herald, that sort of stuff, you know, to see this game, you know? And I mean, so right in the, right off the bat. And then me, and I trust me, I'm, I'm not trying to sound egotistical, but I'm like the guy that all the media can come to because I've been following, I've been to every game. I know all the players, all that kind of stuff, you know, and I could barely get my own work done in that game. But, um, I saw faces that, and I would always get, I would get like a columnist that would come up who'd never been to a game who needed a briefing on stuff. And he wanted to make sure that he was all right in saying this, or he was deferring to me. Well, are you going to use that? Can I use this kind of stuff? You know, that had never happened before, hardly, uh, very rarely. And, and, but it happened a lot that night. Press box was full. And I mean, but there'd been this kind of, we'd had a, we, the Sting had had this kind of rivalry with, with San Diego during the year. And I, didn't they play them earlier in the playoffs, too, that was a best of three? I think so. Yeah, they yeah. won a three-game playoff in, yeah. I think, two games. Yeah, and they had a very good team. and um, But they had this goalie, Volkmar Gross, who was actually a teammate, had been a teammate in Germany of some of the Sting players. And a lot of these guys had, you know, commonality, you know, in their in their backgrounds. And, and Volkmar was a, one of these kind of larger than life people and a wild man and he, he, the Heineken King and all this kind of stuff and everything, you know, and, and he, there'd been times where he'd block sting penalty kicks and things like that, you know, and then kind of beat his chest and point at him and all that. It was, he just played the role perfect. And I mean, and I, and, and I, by that time, a lot of that stuff had sort of been, been flushed out. So people were waiting to see how this was going to, how this was going to play out. And then, and then, you know, the sting wins it and goes to the soccer bowl. But to me, that would ease. And I mean, I believe me, I've covered just about everything, you know, Olympics, all this stuff. And that would be one of my top 10 moments, clearly and probably up towards the, front half, you know, of games that I've been to, you know, that I thought were, A, it was significant because it was the biggest crowd, B, all that weather, the conditions, and the stakes that were there, and then it led to them winning the soccer bowl. So that week then afterwards that led up mm-hmm. to the soccer bowl, what was that week like? Uh, I'm sure, I'm assuming you spent most of it, if not all of it, in Toronto, or were you also yeah. here too? No, I went up early because the league always organizes a whole bunch of stuff for you to do when you get there, and of course this becomes a big marketing tool for them. I, there's still one active... There's still one active Chicago news person who was at covering that soccer ball, and that would be Jim Rose. If he's still at Channel 7, he went up and covered it. I remember that. And and once again, you know, not only was I, you know, I had seen all these media guys, you know, at, at, in Chicago, and many of them being from Chicago, they're all up there now. You know, I mean, they, they really had a big following. And, yeah, I was up there. You know, I, I don't know. I probably went up. Well, I went up. I was there for sure when the team was there, and I probably went up on Wednesday or so of the, you know, Tuesday or Wednesday. And the week itself was like, you know, I, you know, I, I had so many little things I had to take care of. You know, like write stories, and then and I still had to go to practices, talk to players. But by then I had everybody's phone number, and I could take care of a lot of stuff that way. And then I had an obligation to write about the cosmos. I was at least one story I'm sure I wrote on the cosmos and, you know, that kind of stuff. And uh, it was it was a, it was a real week, <laughs> you know, hard work. Was there a real sense in camp and or amongst the the press and, and the the hoi polloi there in, in Toronto that that Chicago had a chance or was this truly the cosmos to win again, having won the year before and yeah, a couple I, times prior I, to that? I, I can't say now, you know, short of. Carl Heinz and Arno and Paul Hahn getting together and saying, hey, we're better than these guys. I can't say that there was a, 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 an undue amount of confidence that they were going to beat the Cosmos. I think there was an awful lot of, we're happy to be here. And frankly, if we lose, we're still going to get all that attention. I mean, that's the state that the league was still in, you know, and, and, and the state of soccer in Chicago. Okay, well, if we didn't win it, okay, but think of all the publicity we got. And next year, the tickets are going to go well. You know, I, I think there was more of that kind of a of a feeling, you know, but anything above that is gravy. Well, as it turned out, it was gravy. They won the game. Well, it, it's also interesting too. I, you, you may, this might've been peripheral to you, but I'm sure you were aware of it at the time. There was, this is also the year, the third year of uh, ABC's national television contract mm-hmm. with the NASL. 
mm-hmm. and it had uh, kind of gone off the rails in 81. Yeah, I don't know if it was live either, was it? Well, so that's the thing. So, yeah. that, so to the point where the only obligation that ABC had was to cover that game, the soccer bowl game, but they chose to tape delay it, and they even – wouldn't allow it to be shown live in the Chicago market, which I know yeah, at the wouldn't. time upset a ton of people. Yeah, yeah. But that, that, that could not have helped, yeah, you right. know, the, the publicity and all that kind of stuff, right? But so it's ironic that here's Chicago, you know, at the precipice and then ultimately winning this great championship after all these years of, you know, sort of building up to it and not being a live showcase event on ABC as it had been the prior yeah. two years. Yeah, it's a little bit like... When Loyola won the NCAA championship in 63, it wasn't live on television. It's hard to believe, you know, or it wasn't shown in Chicago. Maybe that was it. I, I can't remember, but yeah, there was it, some. It, it was shown on tape delay in Chicago that evening. And apparently the the, the uh, WLS was not allowed to, uh, as an owned and operated station of ABC, was not allowed to preempt it for, mm-hmm. for some reason. Either the network vetoed it or there was some other sort of uh, thing. And we've not had Vern Lundquist on this show. At some point, mm-hmm. hopefully we'll get him because he was certainly very active in not only ABC's coverage, but even sure. uh, some sideline stuff and, and you know, uh, some of the Dallas Tornado stuff. So, right. uh, but it just, again, it's hugely ironic. But yeah. but what do you, I, I think also ironic though in that game, right? And again, having been in the stands at that game, assuming the Cosmos were going to win that championship. Again, I grew up as a Cosmos fan. That's my problem, my issue. Uh, and I'm working it out. Uh, it's only been 40 years, but uh, you know, we, we'll, we'll find some breakthrough at some point. These were the two highest scoring teams of the league, and, and yeah. what result did they show? I mean, I yeah. remember it being an exciting game, but yeah, zero zero, boy. Yeah, 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 yeah. But it, but but in some ways, I always thought that was kind of the place to do that because you could show people that there could still be excitement about a game that didn't have a lot of goals in it, and. And, and, and I've certainly grew to appreciate the play that goes on and, you know, the 50-50 balls and, and, and everything, you know, the passing and the strategizing and all that kind of stuff, you know. And, and it, sort of, it sort of didn't, to me personally, it didn't bother me that it came out that way because, because I think it showed that there could still be excitement. So to me, it was like half full, half empty. Well, I think maybe it was still half full in, in, in that case. I mean, there was no way it was going to be a five to four game or something though. I just, I just, I just don't think that, I mean, because the, the game, the teams are going to play halfway conservatively. I think, I mean, the cosmos, if for no other reason, they knew that they could get torched at any time by the sting because they were so electric and quick with their counters and everything. And, and so, and the sting, of course, because here you got any loose ball and if it goes to Canali, it's a goal. I don't care how good uh, Dieter Ferner is, you know, but, uh, um, so, you know, in a way it didn't bother me that it turned out to be that kind of a game. I don't know that it turned off a lot of people. I don't think so. I mean, because the stakes were so high at this point and the buildup had been so great that I don't know that it was that much unexpected. Uh, that makes sense. It was certainly a tension filled game. And then the yeah. shootout, certainly, you know, yeah. the manufactured drama of that. I, I'm, I, again, maybe as a kid sort of uh, found that to be somewhat exciting yeah, and sure. maybe as a way to a better way, perhaps than penalty kicks, you know, to sort of, yeah. yeah. But, um, well, the, the, that's one thing too, that the, you, you just brought up too. The NESL did some experiments with stuff and I thought, you know, FIFA would have been well advised to have picked them up. Now, who am I? I mean, you know, I'm coming in and doing this stuff, but that, that, that those, uh, when they put them on the 35 yard line, I think, and they had like so many, like five seconds to get the shot off again. I thought that, wh- wh- why not do that instead of the penalty? And the other one too, they moved the offsides line at one point too. They moved it up to the 35, which would have created more scoring because it would have meant the buildup could take place. There could be a better buildup because you, and, and when the buildup was completed, you were closer to the goal, you know, I mean, unless some, I mean, if you weren't being trapped by the defenders on the other team or, or during the regular season, the, the, right. the points system, right. Which right. I'm sure was interesting for you to have to, yeah, yeah. I know you always explain to people. That was always a couple sentences, you know, or something, but, but it didn't, it did interrupt with the rules of the game. It actually, right. it just incentivized scoring, which right. our, our previous guest, Paul Gardner, you know, said right. if all the things of all the, you know, the, the innovations that the league brought in, that's a pretty good one that could actually stand the test of time today and maybe be brought into today. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 you know, the league was like a, it was like a laboratory, for a lot of that stuff, for a lot of things, you know, and had money. I mean, you know, they could do things like that. And they had maybe not as much sway with the FIFA as they do now, or not yeah, with FIFA as they do now. But, um, but, but, you know, I, I, I think the league or the 
Federation kind of missed the boat by not maybe picking up on a few. They would have been popular in other countries. Uh, you know, some of those things that they that that, that the NASL did. I think I don't know. But it seemed to me they would be. Well, what are your what are your uh, your your memories of of eighty one's soccer bowl win? Uh, the <laughs> obviously winning in that shootout and and the the chaos that was on the field and all that stuff. I mean, what were your what were your immediate reactions? And then, and frankly, what, what was your how did you sort of deal with all the stuff once you came back to Chicago? Because I don't, I don't think even people in, in Chicago kind of expected kind of the outpouring yeah. of enthusiasm that they got when it came back. My, I, my wife and I had had because you had to do this way in advance. Eighty one, we had scheduled a trip to China about a week after soccer bowl at the last second we were going to probably, and, and and it was a huge deal to go to China in 1981. It was only been about three years after it had been opened up to the, to the Western world. And, and when we planned it, like at the beginning of the season, I said, well, you know, go ahead, you know, whatever. But I mean, so, I mean, they go to the soccer bowl and like, a week later, I'm in China, you know, which was so I didn't get a chance to kind of soak up a lot. But the one thing that I will never forget is getting off the airplane. And and I remember I'm because I flew back with the team. I think they flew back the next day and I flew back with the team because they wanted me to cover kind of what's going on on the plane and all that kind of stuff. And um, so and, and I remember and we were all kind of one big block. And uh, and they didn't have their own plane. They flew. Well, I can't remember the airline. It wasn't a charter of any kind. I don't think. But as I recall, and somebody stood up one of the uh, stewardesses and says, "We we want to warn everybody. Apparently, there's a big reception at the uh, at the gate waiting for you. And in those days, you could walk right up to the gate. And and uh, so you know, be prepared. You know. And we got off, and it was like you had to fight your way to the baggage thing. I mean, you know, I don't not fight, but you had to really get through this thing. And people were just going nuts. You know, and I mean, it was it was fabulous, though, really. I mean, it was really I mean, I'm not a part of the team, but just as an observer, I mean, you know, and I'm writing around I'm talking to people and getting all kinds of quotes and everything. But I mean, I'd never witnessed something quite like that. And, and, and I'm sure it happens a lot. You know, I guess I, but the teams fly on their charter so people can't get access to them like they could here. And, and I mean, even the players were just overwhelmed by this, you know, and I saw a lot of young people, you know, which really was kind of a cool thing to see, you know, and a lot of ethnics. I mean, I just, you could tell, I mean, by their language and stuff like that, you know, and it was, it, it was really something, it, it was really something to see that, you know, to, 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 to walk through that maze of people that just were out there and, and everyone was just like, you know, the, the people that were, uh, that weren't a part of it were just, you know, I mean, like stunned. Were you surprised by all of it? I mean, yeah, I was, I didn't think it would be quite like that, you know, but of course I'd never really been a part of something like that or never been that close to it. But, um, yeah, I was, I mean, I, they, they had a really strong following of a core people. That, and I mean, I mean, it's legendary. Some of the bars after the games, and you know, they, uh, Lincoln Avenue was in w uh, Wilson. In fact, Arno ended up opening a bar up there. And, uh, I mean, there was a couple of Zoom Deutschen Eck and all these places that they would all go to after the game. And, and I mean, it was, they had, I mean, they had a really strong following in the, like the Northern European NSL teams, National Soccer League teams in Chicago, which were the am amateur leagues that were really good. And they had a huge following there. Uh, and I mean, I can remember that. I mean, nobody was buying a drink, you know, I mean, it was as simple as that. But uh, when you were there, were you there for the parade or you had gone to China by then? No, then I was, I was gone for the parade. Okay. So it was like a week later or so uh, down La Salle. But I, you know, I read all the accounts of it and everything, you know, too. But I got, by then I was pretty exhausted. So, uh, uh, but, but, you know, I, I would love to have covered it, but I didn't. And, you know, that's that, you know. <laughs> well, but I mean, I, I talk about a journey though, right? Because you're, you're, you're starting with this sort of fledgling thing that, you know, maybe as a half of a beat, mm -hmm. you know, circa mm -hmm. 74, 75, mm -hmm. you're seeing 4,000 people going to the home games, rattling, the rattling around. And here you are sort of, you yeah. climb the summit along with the team, arguably. Yeah, in my parallel career. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, like, what, what? As we sort of round up here, what, what, give me some names of people that kind of stood out in your mind as as ones that were more memorable, or or you thought maybe defined this team, or or maybe some ones that you know that you remember that frankly most people don't for whatever reason, and you know because this was a team that kind of went through some really tough times in the early days and, you know, climb that mountain. And then, you know, we were at some point we'll get into the part two of all of that with true with people like Kenny Stern and others who were stuck around for the, the indoor game and all that kind of stuff. But, but here we are kind of at the summit, if you will, of this, or maybe the first summit mm -hmm. of this team, any names or people or memories of, of just, you know, people known and unknown that sort of sort yeah, of come to mind yeah. as you 
recollect? Well, I mean, there's the obvious. Pato was a very engaging guy and friendly. And, and for our audience, that's, that's Pato Marhead. I'm sorry, yeah, Pato yeah. Marhead. Very engaging guy. Young kid, fun to watch, fun to be around, exciting, all this kind of stuff. Arno was really a good guy, and and he he got it. I mean, in terms of what my job was, and you know, and and frankly, fed me things that you know, you know, he would say things that he knew might cause a problem, but he didn't bother him, you know. And you know, Carl Heinz was 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 fun to be around, you know, but he was like the teacher's pet sort of a kid that, that that everything was geared to 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 Carl, and some of the other players tended to resent that. I got to know uh, Derek Spaulding fairly well, Scotty, uh, but I think that. Uh, uh, I, I, and, and, but if I could, there's a story though. I mean, some of the stories of these guys was incredible. There was, there was a goalie, Victor Noguera. Now he wasn't with that team. I don't, I know, I know that it was, uh, Dieter Ferner was the goalie. I, I don't think he was even the backup. He might've come in like the next year or a year later, but I remember interviewing, or maybe it was before that. I don't know, but I was interviewing Victor Noguera once as goalie and we were talking and he was about 22 at the time. And he started telling me his background. And I mean, I just fell in love with this stuff. When he was a little kid, he was Portuguese. His parents were Portuguese business people in Mozambique in Africa. So they're like expats from Portugal living in Africa. And then there was a big revolution there. And he said, I can remember fleeing the country at night with, you know, for our lives. And we landed in South Africa. And at age 15 or 16, he started to play, he started to play, he was a soccer player. He was a good little youth soccer player. And he ended up playing professionally in South Africa, late teens, at, 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 on an all black team because he was considered not white. He's from Portugal. So he played for this team for a couple of years. Then he got discovered, he got discovered by Montreal Manic, I think was the name of the team. And they signed him to a contract. So at age like 20, 19, 20, he's flying to Montreal. He flies to London. He gets incarcerated because he's from South Africa and he has had trouble with his passport and they put him in a jail. And he, here he is sitting in this, in this jail or whatever at the airport for like a, a night or two before the Montreal people finally figured out, well, where is he? So they get on the case, they get him out, they, sp they spring him. He comes to Montreal, he plays a season the next season, the team folds in the middle of the season. He goes to Atlanta, and he finishes out the season in Atlanta. Then the sting get him. Now, he's 22 years old. He's fled a revolution. He's played on an all-black team in a band league in South Africa. He's been in a London jail. He's been on a team that folded. And then I ask, I, I would say to my friends, what were you doing when you were 22? <laughs> you know, and these these stories. I mean, I, I, I remember Pato and... Uh, who was it? it was Pato and maybe Davy Houston I was talking to the Falklands war is going on the, the England is fighting Argentina and these guys are from Argentina and England you know it, it's world events it plays out right in soccer and so um I'm talking to them and you know they so I did a story on it you know what they both felt about it and everything you know and, they, and they're both got their arms around each other we can't understand why don't these people learn and you know why don't they settle it on the soccer field you know kind of stuff you know but there were all these human drama stories that were just so good that I've actually I got a call the other day from the Wall Street Journal. This was about a year ago. And a guy's doing a story on Merrill Reese. Now, Merrill Reese was from uh, Morton High School, who was playing for the Sting. He was one of the four Americans. And he was a forward, which was unusual because he usually stuck him back on defense. And he was playing for the Sting when he was in high school. He played for him in the summer before his senior year in high school and scored a couple goals. And, and, and so then he's coming back the next year. And I think Folks was the coach then. And he had one of these he had one of these fathers that was like a helicopter father. Miro did. I can't remember the country they were from. I might've been hungry. I'm not sure. And Miro and, and the father just didn't think that Willie was, or that uh, Bill folks was playing him enough. So he pulled him out of the sting and he got him into a development league in Germany. He was, he was playing on a, a, a development team in Germany. And while he was over there, he got killed in a car crash on the Autobahn. He's like 21 years old. And now I think the IHSA, used they, at one point they named their most valuable high school soccer player the Merrill Reese Award, you know. But, I mean, it was just like all of these. It had, soccer had everything but a mainstream audience, you know. I mean, and and, and if it had, I mean, it, w it would have been even better as a, as, a, as a writer because there were so many things to write about. So that obviously not only trained you, but sort of helped, uh, made you a better writer just generally. What, what did you evolve to post the sting and 
Maybe we can also get into some of your other works and, and obviously a time to promote too some yeah. of those other works. Why not? Please. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I, from there, I, I, w- I covered this thing in 82, the year after they won it. And at the end of this, towards the end of the season in August or whatever, it looked like they weren't going anywhere. Uh, they, they, they made me the college beat guy in time for the start of the college football season. So I did college football for about three or four years. I, uh, I caught the Illinois and the Rose Bowl period, uh, the early Mike White uh, rule uh, year era. And I did that. And then I covered the Blackhawks for a couple seasons and they went nowhere. I mean, this was the, really the dog days. And then I started writing a daily column uh, and I wrote it. Uh, I co-authored it with Linda Kay, the late Linda Kay. It kills me to say that. but um, uh, And I did it with her for two years. And then I took it over by myself because she left the paper. And I wrote a daily sports column called um, Odds and Ends. And I did that for about, uh, I don't know, five years or so, five more years. And then I went to the ink column, Kathy O'Malley. I replaced Kathy O'Malley on the ink column for five years. And then I did feature writing. And I did feature writing for about five years. And basically it was magazine style writing, long features. And so I had this Rolodex. Of course, that's a term when I teach. I went on to teach at DePaul. I have to explain to the kids what a Rolodex is. Yeah, but, you young whippersnappers out there. That's yeah, what we had before yeah. the internet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I used to show them all the president's men and I always would tell them ahead of time, I got to warn you, you're going to see something that's going to scare you. They're called typewriters, you know. So, but anyway, um, so I, I, uh, in the in the five or six years that I wrote for the tempo section, I was able to pull some of these things back into play because I always liked to feel like I was a translator. I was translating soccer and some of these sports for an audience that might not know that much about it. Well, if you take that, you know, if you take that attitude towards other things, the world is your oyster, you know, and I love to tell stories that no one else was telling. And so uh, in the years that I was in the tempo section, like they gave me one of the things I used to write a lot about are the museums in Chicago, the art galleries and stuff. And I used to write stories. And this is when they were spending money uh, at the Tribune, you know, like I'd go on a week's jaunt. In fact, um, the Palais game in Portland, I had a, uh, no, for another story I was at in Portland, um, I had a travel editor call me and she said, I hear you're out in Portland. This was in the eighties. This was in the nineties. And she, I said, yeah, I am. She said, why don't you take an extra week? I'll pay for it and just find a couple stories for me. And I actually found the, the birthplace of Phil Knight and the, and the Nike stuff. kind of. And so I just floated around and doing features, but it worked out because I had all these things. I mean, the city, you know, the, the softball and the soccer and the ethnic groups. And, you know, I knew there was going to be a Balkan war in Yugoslavia before anybody else did when I knew that the, the Bosnian players wouldn't play with the uh, Serbian players. I couldn't get the Serbian guy to go into a Bosnia, you know, to a, a Croatian bar, you know, I mean, that kind of stuff. I mean, you really learn a lot about the world. If you, there's a book called uh, "How Soccer Defines the World" or explains the world, and Frank, it's, it's Franklin Franklin Foer. I think it's great. Yeah. It's just great, and that was my attitude about the whole thing. So, so, uh, but the, you've you've not slowed down since leaving the Tribune. But maybe a little bit of a quick epitaph on the the demise of the American newspaper and the Chicago Tribune in particular. Sure. sure. Uh, not that you want to dance on the grave, but it, it it does. I mean, a lot of what we've we've talked about for the last hour and change has sure, been sure. sort of, uh, you know, a time from when journalism was different mm-hmm. and and the way people got communications was was different and the storytelling behind it mm-hmm. that was a little bit more measured and and it didn't wasn't always instantaneous and or mm-hmm. perverted, shall we say, by uh, you know whatever happens in social media and and mm-hmm. the mm-hmm. twists and turns of all that stuff. Um, mm-hmm. When did you sort of see the Tribune and or print publishing kind of on the wane? Change. And then, yeah. Transition. Change? Okay. <laughs> the polite way, well, I guess. Right. You're being very polite. But. Yeah. Yeah. No, but, but it, it, you know, um, I, I always tell people I left the Tribune in 2005 to go teach at DePaul University full time. And the, the journalism has never been the same. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. But, <laughs> but, uh, but, but I did leave just before everything was starting to, 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 to hit the fan. Right. And, um, I, I, you know, technology ruled. And, and I think what happened in, in, in journalism a lot was the technocrats ruled in the first few years that all these transitions were taking place. They weren't journalists. They weren't newspaper people. And, and a lot of the newspapers, they let the horse out of the barn. They couldn't get it back in because they were giving it away, you know, at, at first. And now people, they just won't pay for it like they used to. And, and frankly, the, 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 not the dirty little secret, but, but the thing is, 
it's the advertising. I mean, it's always been revenue driven. I mean, you got to make money and editorial side doesn't make money other than some of our stuff getting syndicated. But and production is they just pay for themselves by printing the paper and selling it on the street and delivering it. You know, well, advertising is the whole thing and, and people aren't advertising in print anymore. And so you've got this vicious cycle of of uh, of, uh, you know, not the revenue to spend money to increase or to maintain the standards on uh, journalistic. And, and, and I, I don't I haven't been to the Tribune since it moved. And I'm not really one of these that keeps looking over my shoulder because I've moved on to other stuff. But but um, clearly their staff can't be more than 40 percent of what it was when I was there. I mean, when I was there, there were 800 editorial people. And we had at one point we had over 60 people in the sports department, you know, and I, I'll guarantee you there's probably not more than 15 people in the sports department now. I mean, yeah, and I, and I walked by the Tribune building yesterday and it's, uh, you know, it's becoming condos and, um, I, you know, it's just it's it's. It's hard not to get nostalgic, but it's also it's a reminder yeah. that that journalism is different, and sure. I, it could sure. be better or worse. But yeah. I, I I struggle to sort of see how fifty fifty that proposition is. It seems much right. more tilted towards yeah. uh, uncertainties. And all right, so but you have not stopped, and you have got a bunch of of work out there. Actually, one of the one of your books actually is influenced by. A lot of your writings as a, as a Sting Beat reporter. Yeah, I, uh, um, you know, you can take the boy out of writing, but you can't take writing on the boy, I guess, or whatever. I, I, I just, I like to tell stories. And um, so when I left, I taught at DePaul for about seven years full time. And then I left and I, uh, I started toying around with writing books. And I went out to the Iowa Writers Workshop for some sessions and stuff like that. And, um, and then I got this idea of a soccer book. Um, I was picking, I picked up a newspaper in in Miami and I was flying someplace, I can't remember what it was, and there was a, about a big problem in a country called Dominica, not Dominican Republic, Dominica. Their banana industry was in the toilet because the European cabal was cutting them out or something like that or whatever. And then I got to thinking about this David and Goliath kind of thing. And then and then and then I thought, well, okay, why couldn't they import soccer players, naturalize them, and win the World Cup to gain world renown and increase their economy? So I wrote the book called Gold Fever, and it was about. And frankly, that does take that has taken place a lot over in World Cup history. Argentina, Italy, you know, they come back. Well, my grandfather lived in uh, Italy. Well, well you, that's good enough for us. Come on back and play. And um, so I did this book on called Gold Fever, and. Um, it's about how they they bring a bunch of players in and they have identical twin players, Pato and Tato, and of course, Pato Marhetic, and they have complementary skills. One is the passer and the dribbler and the other is the really good shooter. And the strength of their game is that the other teams get them confused. They, they, they mark the wrong one for the wrong reason sometimes. And so then they import a bunch of teams or players Germanic. And of course, there's an Arno out there who's kind of the wise, wise old guy that confers with the coach. The coach is uh, Butsy Fermani, Ed Fermani, who used to be the uh, uh, the coach of the uh, New York Cosmos, in fact, in the soccer bowl. And uh, and 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 he's called Butsy because he once scored a goal when somebody knocked a ball in off his butt into the goal and it won a big game. But anyway, and there's so much funny stuff that happened. It's just I can't let it die. And so I resurrected a lot of these figures. There's a Scotty, Derek Spaulding kind of guy, you know, on the team, too. And so then the little team goes through the whole CONCACAF, the whole uh, regional uh, qualifying and the big bad bogeyman is the United States, which spends millions of dollars on its team compared to these guys who have very like early sting days are playing on public property and everything. And then they go, obviously they go in this, you know, in the, in the whole elimination process and they make it to the World Cup. The left, I'll, the rest I'll leave. Off there. But got to uh, buy the book. Well, yeah, look, yeah. and that's so. Uh, and if any uh, former Sting players or personnel are listening, uh, you I can hear them dialing the uh, their yeah. lawyers now yeah, for yeah. copyright yeah. infringement. Yeah, right. Uh, right. But you also have a, a very similar of the theme book now out in in sort of the college yeah. sports realm too. Right. Tell us how it's about that. Yeah, I, I, two colleges that are diametrically uh, different. Um, one cheats, and I say they get to the final four the old fashioned way in NCAA basketball. They cheat. And the other one is made up of entire team is most of the all the starters and a couple of bench guys are from China. They're transfers and they're there for the year to play just basketball, but they're from China. But the, but the Chinese players are also diligent students, unlike the other guys on the other team. So it's, it's kind of a book of contrast. And um, I, I got that idea from I, I taught a summer in China at Shaman where basketball was a really big deal. And uh, I made some friends and stuff, and I and I thought about, well, why can't this happen? You know, in fact, why? You know, it's, there's versions of it going on right now. So I have a, it's it's kind of a similar thing. So you 
like the soccer team, you sort of follow them and then you follow the United States and the, uh, the eventual matchup they'll have to get to the World Cup. And this one, I have these two schools, you know, doing different things to get to the top and they meet for the championship in Wintrust Arena. So uh, uh, anyway, so but I like to do those things. And that one's called Transfer U. You buried the lead there. U, yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. Transfer U, yeah, capital U with a period. And um, so then and I'm working on another one. So uh, I like the whole idea of town gown. And the next one is a, is a, a, basically a sequel to Transfer You. So uh, anyway, but without the sport element. All right. Last question. Sure. Uh, since we kind of been, sorry, we're, we're actually recording this in a, uh, a local history museum in mm-hmm. Lake Forest, Illinois, where we both live, which I think is uh, ironic for a, n- a number of different uh, reasons. Do you ever envision telling maybe more comprehensively, say, the story of the sting, given that was such a the lo- one of the longest periods of your of your mm-hmm. career, do you think that now that that soccer is is gotten to another level with Major League Soccer and perhaps a rebranding of the Chicago Fire team, mm-hmm. as has been rumored, and them coming back to the city of Chicago and and all that kind of stuff? Do you ever sense that there's maybe something in the in the archives, the Conklin household archives, that uh, you know might uh, uh, make sure. for some good storytelling? Well, well, what I would like, what what interests me would be to go back and revisit some of these guys and find out what they're doing today. And a bunch of the Sting players, the guys from Germany, come over here like in the summer sometimes, and you know spend a week, re, you know, reuniting, getting out of the house for a week, that kind of stuff. And that would be one. I, I ran into Pato once, of all places, in the casino in Las Vegas once, and they, and and he was standing in the background with me while they were filming that movie uh, with Dustin Hoffman where he plays an autistic, uh, he's autistic and his bigger brother. Yeah, Rain Man. Yeah, right. Yeah. Rain, they were filming a scene there. There's yeah. a scene where he's in a, in a casino or something and there was Pato. You know, and he's in the, he's in the scene. He, no, he's not in the scene, but no. we're both standing there watching. I'm like, Pato, my heartache, I can't believe this. You know, he's up in Michigan now, I think. But um, I'd like to go back and revisit some of those guys. And I'm sure there's some just as there were then. And sometimes these stories didn't get told. Now they can get told. And I've always, I've often thought about revisiting and going back. I love those kind of where are they now kinds of stories, you know, pieces of history. Fifty years ago, this happened. In fact, that's the premise for this book that I'm doing now. Uh, something that happened fifty years ago. And um, I'd like to go back and and write about that. You know, I, I see a lot of soccer books on Amazon, but they all tend to be very niche sort of things. And these guys were so cosmopolitan and so international that I, I got to think there's some good stories in there. I, I, well, Dickie Advocat would be the perfect example. Dickie Advocat coached the, a Dutch in, uh, in the World Cup. He was the, was it Hibernia or Glasgow or one yeah. of the Rangers or one of those teams in Scotland. He went on to, uh, to uh, you know, really become among the elite coaches in the world. You know, I mean, Gordon Hill would be a good one. He became a big star at Manchester United and then he burned out. I don't know what happened and it would be fun to find out. All right, I suspect that that will not be the last episode we ever do on the Chicago Sting. Indeed, we are uh, efforting, uh, hopefully soon rather than later, a uh, conversation with uh, the great uh, owner of the Chicago Sting, Lee Stern, and uh, that's hopefully within uh, within weeks. Uh, we look forward to bringing that to you at some point uh, in the reasonably near future. But uh, Mike Conklin uh, has been uh, just stupendous. Uh, in setting the table for uh, this very rich tableau of the Chicago Sting story. And if you uh, live in or have grown up or, or used to live in the Chicago area, the Sting is a very interesting team uh, that continues to resonate mostly with warm fuzzies, uh, depending on who you ask, uh, and uh, the championships, plural, that uh, it brought to, at the time, a very uh, championship-starved uh, metropolitan area in Beautiful Chicago, Illinois. Let's see. Mike's uh, books that we mentioned uh, are available for sale, of course, wherever you find good books. But uh, if you want to give us a few shekels of love, why don't you scoot on over to goodseatsstillavailable.com, our website. Search up this episode with Mike Conklin and you'll uh, you'll find a link or links actually to both of uh, the books that we mentioned. Uh, one being Goal Fever, uh, his book from late 2016, obviously with uh, many uh, sort of clandestine and maybe not so uh, hard to decipher names and uh, remembrances and then winkings and noddings to some of the names and people that uh, and characters, frankly, that uh, might cover during a Chicago sting years. 
as well as his current book. It's called Transfer U, the letter U as in university, Transfer U. Uh, that came out in the tail end of 2018. Uh, both of those books uh, can be found when you search up our uh, our episode on our website. And uh, when you click on those links, you'll be whisked away to Amazon and uh, we'll get a couple of shekels as a recompense for doing so. And I and Mike, of course, will both thank you uh, for, uh, you know, not only finding the book and buying them, but, uh, you know, uh, showing your support uh, therewith. Let's see what else. While you're at GoodSeatStillAvailable.com, our little website, uh, you can do all kinds of fun stuff like find our social media feeds. Of course, we're on Twitter at Good Seats Still. You'll find us on uh, Instagram at Good Seats Still Available. Uh, you will find a Facebook page devoted to us. All the links to those can be found uh, on the website, as well as uh, a link to our newsletter, which you can get each and every week if you want to know a little heads up, a little early warning signal, if you will, of who's going to be on the show the upcoming week. Uh, you can sign up for that there, too as well as a link to uh, sending us some email, which you can also do directly. And that's at hello at goodseatsstillavailable.com. All right, so that's uh, that. And uh, one last thing, of course, we cannot do this show uh, without the good uh, help and graces uh, and skills, frankly, of our pal Jerry Payne, who is the uh, chief producer, cook and bottle washer uh, for this show. And he, of course, is part of the Podfly Productions family. And if you're ever interested in figuring out how to get involved in podcasting yourself, well, ho, ho, my friends, the best place to start to learn all about it and maybe even get some production support and help ongoing, as we have for almost three years now. It's Podfly Productions, and you can find out more about them at podfly.net. Okay, we are done for this week, believe it or not. We thank you tremendously for finding us and listening all this way. And uh, until next week, we bid you a fond adieu. And until then, we now consider the ticket window now closed. Take care, everybody. Everybody.